Chapter Seven of Outwitting the Hun: My Escape from a German Prison Camp by Pat O'Brien. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Crawling Through Germany. The exact spot at which I made my desperate leap, I don't know. Perhaps after the war is over, someone on that train will be good enough to tell me, and then I may go back and look for the dent I must have made in the rock ballast. As I have said, I didn't stop very long that morning after I once regained my senses. I was bleeding profusely from the wounds caused by the fall, but I checked it somewhat with handkerchiefs I held to my face, and I also held the tail of my coat so as to catch the blood as it fell and not leave tell-tale traces on the ground. Before I stopped I had gone about a mile. Then I took my course from the stars, and found that I had been going just opposite to the direction I should be making, but I could not go back across the track there. Heading west, therefore, I kept this course for about two and a half hours, but as I was very weak from loss of blood, I didn't cover very much ground in that time. Just before daylight I came to a canal which I knew I had to cross, and I swam it with everything I had on. This swim, which proved to be the first of a series that I was destined to make, taught me several things. In the first place I had forgotten to remove my wristwatch. This watch had been broken in my fall from the air, but I had had it repaired at Coutray. In the leap from the train the crystal had been broken again, but it was still going, and would probably have been of great service to me in my subsequent adventures, but the swim across the canal ruined it. Then, too, I had not thought to take my map out of my sock, and the water damaged that, too. Thereafter, whenever I had any swimming to do, I was careful to take such matters into consideration, and my usual practice was to make a bundle of all the things that would be damaged by water, and tie it to my head. In this way I was able to keep them dry. It was now daylight, and I knew that it would be suicidal for me to attempt to travel in the daytime. My British uniform would have been fatal to me. I decided to hide in the daytime and travel only at night. Not far from the canal I could see a heavily wooded piece of ground, and I made my way there. By this time I had discovered that my left ankle had been strained in my leap from the train, and when I got to the woods I was glad to lie down and rest. The wound in my mouth had been opened too when I jumped and it would have been difficult for me to have swallowed had not the piece of bread which was to serve for my breakfast got wet when I swam the canal. I found a safe hiding place in which to spend the day, and I tried to dry some of my clothes, but a slight drizzling rainfall made that out of the question. I knew that I ought to sleep as I planned to travel at night, but sore as I was, caked with mud and blood, my clothing soaked through, and my hunger not nearly appeased, sleep was out of the question. This seemed to me about the longest day I had ever spent, but I was still to learn how long a day can really be, and how much longer a night. When night came I dragged myself together and headed northeast. My clothing consisted of my flying corps uniform, two shirts, no underwear, leather leggings, heavy shoes, a good pair of wool socks, and a German cap. I had a wallet containing several hundred francs in paper money and various other papers. I also had a jackknife, which I had stolen one day from the property room at Courtrai, where all the personal effects taken from prisoners were kept. For a day or two I carried the knapsack, but as I had nothing to carry in it, I discarded it. I traveled rapidly, considering my difficulties, and swam a couple of canals that night, covering in all perhaps ten miles before daylight. Then I located in some low bushes, lying there all day in my wet clothes, and finishing my sausage for food. That was the last of my rations. That night I made perhaps the same distance, but became very hungry and thirsty before the night was over. For the next six days I still figured that I was in Germany, and I was living on nothing but cabbage, sugar beets, and an occasional carrot, always in the raw state, just as I got them out of the fields. The water I drank was often very rank, as I had to get it from canals and pools. One night I lay in a cabbage patch for an hour, lapping the dew from the leaves with my tongue. 
During this period I realized that I must avoid meeting any one at all hazards. I was in the enemy's country, and my uniform would have been a dead giveaway. Any one who captured me or who gave information from which my capture resulted might have been sure of a handsome reward. I knew that it was necessary for me to make progress as fast as possible, but the main consideration was to keep out of sight, even if it took me a year to get to Holland, which was my objective. From my map I estimated that I was about thirty-five miles from Strasbourg when I made my leap from the train, and if I could travel in a straight line I had perhaps one hundred and fifty miles to travel. As it was, however, I was compelled to make many detours, and I figured that two hundred and fifty miles was nearer the extent of the journey ahead of me. In several parts of this country I had to travel through forests of young pine trees about twelve feet high. They were very close together and looked almost as if they had been set out. They proved to be a serious obstacle to me, because I could not see the stars through them, and I was relying upon the heavens to guide me to freedom. I am not much of an astronomer, but I know the pole star when I see it. But for it I wouldn't be here today. I believe it rained every night and day while I was making my way through Germany to Luxembourg. My invariable program at this stage of my journey was to travel steadily all night until about six in the morning when I would commence looking around for a place wherein to hide during the day. Low bushes or woods back from the road as far as possible from the traveled pathway usually served me for this purpose. Having found such a spot, I would drop down and try to sleep. My overcoat was my only covering, and that was usually soaked through either from the rain or from swimming. The only sleep I got during these days was from exhaustion, and it usually came to me toward dusk when it was time for me to start again. It was a mighty fortunate thing for me that I was not a smoker. Somehow I have never used tobacco in any form, and I was now fully repaid for whatever pleasure I had foregone in the past as a result of my habits in that particular, because my suffering would certainly have been intensified now if, in addition to lack of food and rest, I had to endure a craving for tobacco. About the sixth night I was so drowsy and exhausted when the time came for me to be on the move that I was very much tempted to sleep through the night. I knew, however, that that would be a bad precedent to establish, and I wouldn't give in. I plugged wearily along, and about eleven o'clock, after I had covered perhaps four miles, I sat down to rest for a moment on a shock of brush which was sheltered from the drizzle somewhat by other shocks which were stacked there. It was daylight when I awoke, and I found myself right in a German backyard. You can imagine that I lost no time getting out of that neighborhood, and I made up my mind right then that I would never give way to that tired feeling again. In the daytime, in my hiding place, wherever it happened to be, I had plenty of opportunity to study my map, and before very long I knew it almost by heart. Unfortunately, however, it did not show all the rivers and canals which I encountered, and sometimes it fooled me completely. It must have been about the ninth night that I crossed into Luxembourg, but while this principality is officially neutral, it offered me no safer a haven than Belgium would. The Huns have violated the neutrality of both, and discovery would have been followed by the same consequences as capture in Germany proper. In the nine days I had covered perhaps seventy-five miles, and I was that much nearer liberty. But the lack of proper food, the constant wearing of wet clothes, and the loss of sleep and rest had reduced me to a very weakened condition. I doubted very much whether I would be able to continue, but I plugged along. End of chapter 7